Good morning, friends. Welcome to East Side Worship with us this third Sunday of the Easter season. Because it is the Easter season, I greet you this morning with the pronouncement that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. My name is Katie Farmer, and I'm one of the staff members here at East Side. Today, my husband Matt is here with me in the building to help run our digital service, and all the rest of our East Side staff are worshiping at home with their families. Before we begin worship today, I do want to share that our bishop, Sue Halpert Johnson, and the cabinet of the North Georgia United Methodist Church Conference have asked all churches to remain closed for in-person gatherings at least through May 13th. As the cabinet makes more decisions on timing, we will be sure to keep you updated. As we've shared through this time, Eastside is working hard to ensure that social distancing does not mean social disconnection. In light of this focus, today is the fourth Sunday of the month, which means it is Eastside Community Makers Sunday. We invite you to write letters to those in our community who you miss or who you know may be struggling during this time. Please contact any of the staff if you need someone's address to mail a letter to them. Let us now begin our worship with the fifth century prayer, with a fifth century prayer, a reminder that our faith is deeper, stronger, wider, and longer than any of us could hope to imagine. Almighty God, through your only son, you overcame death and opened to us the gates of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate our Lord's resurrection by the renewing of your spirit arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the 116th Psalm, and it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's here, where your blood was spilled, for my Came flesh, born. 
second reading today is from the New Testament book of Luke, and it's the time after Jesus' resurrection when the disciples are on the road to Emmaus. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, what is the conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they still stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? 
And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now. was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour Good morning, friends. This is Pastor Tim, 
from my kitchen, and it's Saturday evening, and as you can tell, we're doing things a little bit differently and even a little more different than we've been doing them. Um, I've been struggling with my voice and thought it might be best for me to stay home and do this recording ahead of time for y'all. Um, if you're a guest with us, we're thrilled that you're here. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you have felt as warmly welcomed as is possible um, with remote church as we're doing it. Um, we look forward, hopefully, to a day when we will all be able to gather together in body in our beautiful sanctuary in East Atlanta. But we are honored and privileged and, and overjoyed that you're with us. Um, and if you are a guest, just a little bit of context may be helpful in terms of where we've been in our preaching and teaching. Since January, we have been in a series we've titled Rooted and Grounded. And we borrowed that phrase from a section of one of Paul's letters to an ancient community that was in Ephesus. And at the beginning of the year of 2020, before knowing the way that this year was going to unfold, we just had a sense that there was something about this rooted and groundedness that would be, uh, that would resonate. And the way we've attacked it, the way we've entered into it, is we began with the rooted metaphor that Paul offers. And we used the rooted metaphor to to make the comparison between organics, plant life, trees, and our own spiritual dimension. That part of us that has that divine DNA made in the image of God. And we walk through the kind of practices and ways that we can can expand that part of our lives. And then, at the beginning of Lent, we moved from the rooted metaphor to the grounded. And we move from the image of organics to that of architecture. And we move from the individual to whole communities, asking the question, what kind of, what kind of architecture is, is healthy and holistic? And what can we learn from the ancient church communities? So what we've been doing is walking through, looking at the different communities in Scripture and the documents that were either letters written to them or uh, accounts of their lives in their communities. And we began with Jesus and his disciples, the earliest Jesus society, if you will. And then we have been walking through the New Testament. And this morning we come to another ancient community, this one located in uh, Colossae. And it's the letter to the Colossians. And it it's interesting because the Apostle Paul is, is writing this letter to this community, but he's never met them. And he's learned about them through other means and ventures and, and conversations, but he's writing to a community that he has not met. And this is a, a, a dense uh, book of scripture, and there's a lot you could do with Colossians. And we're going to just look at the first uh several verses of this text and walk through them because I think they help us see a lot about what, what Paul saw in from a distance, that church community to whom he was writing. So friends, as I read, I invite you to listen to the word of God from Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You've heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. 
For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Friends, the word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we gather in your name. We seek a fresh word from you. God, even though this message is pre-recorded, may it speak the way it needs to speak to those who encounter it. Speak through it, God, and where necessary, speak in spite of me. As I preach, God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the collective meditations of all of our hearts would indeed be good, right, pleasing, acceptable in your sight. God, our rock, God, our redeemer, God, our savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the text is honestly a sermon in itself, just laid bare as it stands. It is this beautiful eloquent, rich writing, and it was really hard as I was working through Colossians to know exactly where to stop reading, because Paul doesn't really take much of a breath. Um, So instead of trying to read an overabundance of the text, I would invite you to do that on your own time, and we're just going to look at the front end of this. And As I was reading this text, I was reminded of of a brilliant sermon preached many years ago now by uh, Rob Bell, and his sermon, it just sunk in deeply with these two words, grace and peace, where Paul begins, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Because if you just stopped there and you created a church culture, an architectural Society of believers who started every interaction with every other human with these two words. May the grace and peace of God be with you. Not just the words, the the whole posture of our hearts. What if in in the middle of this crazy world, even... Even as we're avoiding people on the sidewalk with masks on, is it possible for us still to to offer a a posture of grace, a posture of peace in the middle of this? Grace, different definitions, but one of my favorite is the idea of unmerited favor, of, of gift. Reality offered from another that is simply undeserved. And it's not that grace just lets people off the hook for being jerks. It's not okay for any of us to be perpetual jerks. But grace is approaching whomever it might be with the love of the creator, a heart that is being filled and shaped by a loving God. Grace, unmerited favor, a gift that, that we didn't and we don't even necessarily deserve, but a gift that ultimately will change us. This is why Paul follows, I think, grace with peace. Because if you if you know much about peace in the ancient Jewish imagination, it just comes from this Hebrew word shalom. And, and shalom had this big cosmic idea of being the world properly ordered. Put, to, put together in such a way that it can be named and it's experienced as really good. Shalom, peace, is God's best actually being implemented in creation. 
Not, not even necessarily the way things were supposedly supposed to be, but the way the world could be. We aren't just fixing something that's broken. Though I think in this season it's pretty clear to everyone that the world is broken. But Paul, he invites us to participate in creating the world that God dreams for us and that God wants for us. Life is grace. Life is unmerited gift. Our hereness, if I can make up a word, Though, yes, it is broken, it is imperfect, it is still gift. It starts with a grace for our fellow human beings and the telos, the the direction that that grace pushes towards is shalom, is peace, is wholeness, is goodness, is new life, and it's fixing things at the same time. Because there is always a new gift. The grace of God never runs out, and even when it feels like it might have or like it should, God's grace approaches brokenness with unmerited favor and hope for transformation and ultimate good. Grace and peace, ultimate good. And Paul begins so many of his letters in this way, a clear intent that he hopes for, is praying towards desires the the ultimate good for those to whom he's writing. Instead of a premise of fear or suspicion or anger or bitterness or jealousy or hatred. What if we approached human beings, even in this crazy time, with with an intent for their ultimate good? As a human collective, right now, today, more than ever, we need to be a people who are offering grace and peace and goodness and wholeness, a posture towards everybody of an undeserved love. Paul, he goes on to write in verse 3, In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this, that Paul takes the time to pray for his church, or this church that he's never met, these people he doesn't even know. And he doesn't only pray for them, but he's, he's praying for them when they don't know it. And his prayers aren't just petitions, they're just offerings of gratitude. It's like in Paul's time spent with God, sometimes he just says, I thank you God for the Colossians. I hear great things. Paul here says, I'm just thankful for you all. He goes on to write, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. The reason he is so overwhelmed with gratitude for this community is because apparently they were so exemplary that they have people talking about them. This church community, the news apparently was getting out. Apparently they had a good reputation that was preceding them and that that reputation was that this community was, indeed, good news for the world. Their faith in the Christ has led them to be a community who loved one another well. And so much so that Paul tells us, yo, the news has gotten out. Y'all, we've heard about you. You all have a faith in the Christ that is clearly translating into the way you love one another a seriousness about the Christ, a trust in the Christ, transformation in following after our resurrected Lord. We have heard about your powerful faith in the Christ, and it clearly is translating into the love that you offer for your fellow humans. A faith in the Christ so profound that people were being transformed through this community to move from the normal default place of self-centeredness, of the narcissism we're all born with, but into these new kind of humans who have this crazy posture of grace and peace and love, even to people they've never met. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 5, that it's because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. They are a community rooted and grounded in hope. 
Paul uses the word heaven here, but that can be a little bit misleading. Paul's ultimate conception of heaven wasn't just that it was sort of an ethereal place where human souls got to go and their bodies gave way. Paul's conception of heaven is, is way larger and bigger and more robust. Paul, while he may have been the, the leader of the early Gentile movement, he was still himself thoroughly Jewish, and first century Judaism connected heaven with, with a future new creation. And Saul tied to Shalom, ultimate good, to everything being made new, to everything being made right. And Paul knows and he says, and, and, and we know, but we need reminded that that hope, that posture, has the capacity to root and to ground us, even in the middle of a storm, even in the middle of a pandemic. Resurrection hope. And we're still in the Easter season. And our resurrection hope is made real through the Christ, through God's emptying of the tomb, because one empty tomb means that eventually they're all going to be empty. And he's grounded in a stone that has been rolled away. So the calling of these verses 2,000 years later under quarantine or social distancing and isolation is maybe to simply begin by offering grace and peace to one another. To offer a, a grace that is seeking to bring about God's ultimate good in the lives of those around us. Resurrection is tied to shalom, is tied to ultimate good, and our hope is in God's ultimate good for each of us, the future of God's creation. God brought us into the world, into being, and Christian hope is that that being never ceases. And that, my friends, is good news. And may that root us, may that ground us once again. And may we always practice a posture of grace and peace, maybe now more than ever. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Well, friends, this would normally be the time in the service where we pass offering baskets and people give with physical objects. But as we know, thankfully there are no offering baskets that are being passed because that's not terribly hygienic. Um, But in this season, obviously, all the things that the church is trying to do are still at play. We're just trying to do them differently, which means our budgetary needs are still there, which means... We need your continued support and your help in this time. So we're just encouraging folks as much as possible, if you, if you can, uh, to move to the online giving portal, uh, give the Give app. And if you've already been giving faithfully in the midst of this storm, thank you. Uh, if you're new to our community and you want to support the work we do, um, we would love that. But please don't feel any pressure to have to give. And if you're going through a really, really hard time right now, Um, which I know many of you are, we don't want you to feel any pressure. We need you to take care of you, and we need you to be okay, too. So, with that, grace and peace, my friends.
Good morning again, friends. At this time, I'll be leading us through a time of communal prayer and confession. This time joins our hearts and minds together with God and our fellow worshipers. Even while we are physically apart, we worship collectively. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond out loud at home or by typing into our live stream thread, hear our prayer. Before we pray, let us breathe together. As our community and world begin the process of determining how to safely return to collective life, I invite you to take a breath and offer thanks that we have made it through another strange and confusing week. God, our creator, our protector, our parent, we come to you in this time of fear, uncertainty, and separation. We worry for our families, friends, communities, states, country, and for the nations of the world. God, remind us that at the same time, you hear our prayers as well as the prayers of the entire world. You are omnipresent and have the capacity to comfort each of us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our world aches for normalcy, for a vaccine, for a way to end this pandemic, we pray for wisdom on how to do so safely. We thank you, God, that here in our country, we have the space and the ability to social distance, to socially distance. We pray, God, for those who cannot, for those who live in refugee camps, in communities that don't have space or ability to wash hands and sanitize, and in other situations of danger and fear. God, we pray that these communities will be safe from this virus. We are thankful to continue to see outpourings of love, collective effort, and generosity. Help us to breathe through our anxiety and fear and to come together in unique and safe ways to care for our world in this time. We ask for forgiveness for years of treating our world, your creation, as expendable. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day this week, with our world nature healing around us, let us not take this for granted and help us to continue to care for our Earth when we exit this time of social distancing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country that our leaders would provide a consistent message that we can all believe in and hear, that we would stay at home so that those who work in our healthcare system can continue to manage the pandemic. We pray for our doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who are exhausted, brave, and continuing to care for their patients. Patients who may be dying alone because they cannot be surrounded by their loved ones. We pray for those working in labs to develop testing, and vaccines and are searching for cures to stem the tide of infection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for our state and our city, Lord. We pray for those who have to leave the safety of their homes to find food, to continue working in restaurants, grocery stores, and service agencies. We pray for those who have difficult decisions ahead of them as we begin to see areas of our country reopen. We pray for those who feel they must choose between safety and employment. We pray for our neighbors without homes who cannot isolate and who must rely on others for food and information in this time. We pray for all those who have used our church's little free pantry in this time of need and that our congregation will be able to provide continued access to food in our community in this way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, we lift up the many burdens and anxieties that have been shared on our digital comment stream this morning and over the last weeks. We lift up now the friends and family of our community at Eastside Church. We pray especially for the Gray family, the Launer family, Melanie, the Wandless family, Buddy, Nick and Angela, Sherry, Keith, and Norman, the Rabley family, John, Alicia and her father, Sandra, Caroline, B, Betty, Sherry, Katie, and Brianna, Veronica, Katie, Suzanne, Debbie, Lisa, Brenda, Doug, Elizabeth, Maggie, Zach, and Cole, Glenda, the Buttram family, Chris, Carolyn, Ansley, Hazel, Mary Jane, Cecil, Sally, Tom, David, Zach, Harlan, Roger, Kevin, Diane, Eleanor, Kathy, Shirley, 
Bobby, Diana, Hilda, Susan, Phyllis, Copeland, Nora, Mike, Mem, Jean, Lauren, Lila and Rob, Eugene, Joe, Cole, and Ella, Mitch, Carla, and Austin, Jim, Jody, Ethan, and Kaylee, the Lloyd family, Natalie and Christopher, Woody, Raymond, Roisin, and Allison, the essential workers in our lives and community, for graduating seniors and their families, for families dealing with a cancer diagnosis and those fighting cancer alone during this time, for those who are in detention centers and seeking asylum, for those who are incarcerated, for all who are struggling financially, who are dealing with the stress of job loss or being furloughed, for all who grieve in isolation and have to navigate their losses without the physical support of family and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also for our ministry partners that are supported by Eastside, our little free pantry and closet, which we fill and find emptied so many times each week, for Wellroot, for East Atlanta Kids Club, for Brandon Towers. God, we also lift up the many local businesses in and around East Atlanta. We pray for owners that are facing difficult decisions as they continue to operate in limited capacities. We pray for those workers and their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful parent, help us to remember that social distancing does not mean social disconnection. Help us to be for one another the community that we ourselves seek. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, God, we come to you in confession. We confess to you again this morning as we have so many times before. Lord, we come empty-handed and in need of grace. We pray that you would hear us now as we silently acknowledge before you the ways in which we have fallen short. God of reconciliation, we thank you that no matter the state of our world or the state of our hearts, nothing can separate us from your love. God, we thank you that in acknowledging our own shortcomings, we find a surprising kind of grace that reorients us and gives us hope. Help us live into that hope this day and every day. God, may our words of confession be accompanied by acts of re reconciliation. Sibling in, siblings in Christ, hear the good news. Christ died for us as we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God, and amen. I now invite you, however you are able, to pass peace with those you live with in our live stream, through a text message, through a video, or in any other way. Peace be with you, friends.
Now we invite you all to join us for the love feast, which is also known as an agape meal. This is a time um, where we join each other in Christian fellowship to recall the meals that Jesus shared with his disciples during his ministry. Although its origins in the early church are connected with the Lord's Supper, the two services are quite distinct um, and shouldn't be confused with each other. The modern history of the love feast began with the Moravians in Germany, and they introduced it as a service of sharing, food, prayer, religious conversation, and hymns. I love the connection of the love feast with our Methodist roots, especially here in Georgia, because it was in Savannah that John Wesley first partook of the love feast with the Moravians. Since then, it's taken a regular place in Methodist society. And the love feast has been held on occasions when we cannot come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper and therefore can be led by a lay person. This isn't communion and it doesn't take the place of communion, but it is a shared meal where we can come together while we're not meeting in person. And we are still a community sharing fellowship with each other through many of these digital ways. So a love feast typically consists of a song, scripture, reading, a short reflection, and the sharing of a meal. Today, we'll join in a prayer by Charles Wesley, and then we'll follow that by our own meal. This can be anything you might have in your pantry that represents bread and juice. Nick and I are using a hamburger bun and cranberry juice. So first, pray with me. Father of earth and heaven, the hungry children feed. Thy grace be to our spirits given that true immortal bread. Grant us in all our race in Jesus Christ to prove the sweetness of thy pardoning grace, the manna of thy love. Amen. Now we invite you to share your meal and offer thoughts and peace with those in your home. If you live or worship alone, we share this meal with you digitally and offer thanks that you are a part of our community. Though we are not all together in person, we share this meal as we remember and celebrate our faith and our community. Nick, though we are not all together in person, we share this meal as we remember and celebrate our faith in our community.
Good morning, Eastside. We're so glad that you took the time out of your Sunday morning to be here with us digitally today. We've got a few announcements for you for this week. Um, first and most important is that we are continuing to meet digitally at least through May 13th. Uh, Bishop Sue has um, issued some guidance for all of the churches in the conference uh, and has encouraged us to continue to not gather in person through May 13th. Uh, we expect that we will get an update sometime this week, perhaps as early as tomorrow, on um, guidelines on how we can best evaluate and plan on how to reopen our church facilities safely once uh, once we've been given the green light to do that. So. Um, we encourage you to continue to worship at home with us uh, for the next couple of weeks until we have the all clear to worship together in person again. Uh, we are also encouraging everyone to join in our virtual uh, community makers this week uh, by writing letters to fellow church members or you can write more letters to residents of Brandon Towers. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, this Sunday as we um, think about what it means to be in community when we can't be physically together. Uh, we want to say again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for continuing to give uh, to Eastside. Uh, we are doing very well in terms of the budget. We are on track for where we ought to be. And so um, we really appreciate all of you who are continuing to give during this time. We know that's not possible for all of you. Um, and so we say thank you to those of you who have uh, figured out how to make it work. Uh, and we want you to know that if you are in a position where you cannot give at this time um, because of layoffs or furloughs, that we understand that completely and we want to help you. So let us know if there's anything that we as your church family can do for you as you continue to help us. We have some upcoming digital events. Uh, so again, we have uh, game nights on Tuesdays and we have youth group on Wednesdays and the Eastside Kids Collective is uh, recorded. Although uh, this week we are doing, uh, have done slash are doing digital meetings over Zoom. So we encourage you to reach out to Katie, Karina, or Roxy uh, for any of those pieces of information. So Katie for game night or core groups, Karina for youth group, and Roxy for uh, kids ministries so that you can get those links and stay connected with us. Um, we are still um, always looking for people to help stock the pantry uh, outside the church. Um, be in touch with Katie if you are able to do that or if you even just want to make a donation of some food that we can use to uh, fill the pantry. Um, if you have anything happening in your life right now, anything to celebrate or to mourn or that needs to be prayed about, we encourage you to reach out to the care team, care at eastsideatl.org, uh, so that we can connect you with the people who can help care for you. Um, that's it for announcements. Again, we're not meeting in person until at least May 13th. So keep an eye on the newsletter. If you're not getting the newsletter, please reach out to me or to Katie so that we can get you added to the mailing list. And we will see you virtually next week for worship. Bye. Oh, Father.
Thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, we open this morning with a fifth century prayer, spent time with the first century Colossian church, and now I'd like to leave you with this 13th century prayer as we go forth from this time together into another week of unknowns. God be in your head and in your understanding. God be in your eyes and in your looking. God be in your mouth and in your speaking. God be in your heart and in your thinking. God be at your end and at your departing. Peace be with you, friends. Amen.